Good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to today's uh, HEC Connection Points peer-to-peer uh, -peer workshop that will be conducted by Mr. Warden, Warden Manning. Um, Warden has 20 years experience in the HSC fraternity and is a lecturer in HSC related subjects. He holds a BTEC in safety management, a post-grad diploma in occupational health. His topic today that he's covering is occupational health and safety legal landscape. Um, so without any further ado, uh, Mr. Warren Manning, you can take it away. Thank you, sir. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, now, in this COVID uh, situation, we are getting a lot of uh, regulations and guidelines and all of this and, and sort of coming thick and fast. So I, I thought maybe it would be good for us to just to, again to step back and uh, look at the legal landscape that we we we, we operate in occupational health and safety. So this is a presentation I do sometimes uh, at um, at the university with uh, some of the uh, medical students there. So it is mostly designed for people who have almost no exposure to occupational health and safety. So forgive me uh, if some of the stuff is 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 is, is obvious to you guys. Um, so, if you look at the, the, um, the lay of the land uh, in terms of occupational health and safety in South Africa, uh, it could be uh, convenient to, to look at it as, 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 as three main provinces. So, you've got the, the province of occupational health and safety, you've got the province of the Mine Health and Safety Act, and you've got the, the province of the Maritime Shipping Act. So, these are the three. Uh, occupation health and safety acts that uh, create the landscape that generate the 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 the, the, the geography uh, of occupation health and safety in here in blue is the is the, is the sort of what I call the semi autonomous uh, region of the national nuclear regulator and we'll come back to that it's within to note at the moment it is within the the, the province of the occupation health and safety act but it also does certain things which are a little bit interesting. So first we look at the, the province of Occupational Health and Safety Act. And again, this, this, is, this presentation is designed to people, for people who, are, who, are, who have got almost no uh, exposure to OSH. So if we look at the province of Occupational Health and Safety Act, it's, it's the, 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 the biggest province that we have in, in, in the country, meaning that it applies to uh, more um, workplaces than than any of the other uh, the other two, um, and we'll come to except of course as you guys know mining areas and the other one is is, is, is people who are working on ships certain people working on ships. So the 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 occupational health and safety act we can look at as as like the provincial road for this province. It's the main road that runs through the area. Branching off from that road, uh, which I'm calling dis district uh, roads, are the regulations. And, and we know we've got like, I don't know, 20 odd uh, sets of regulations. Um, all your different, you know, like your general safety, your administrative act, your noise induced hearing loss, your another one that's, that's uh, occupying our minds a lot these days is the has biological, biological uh, agents. Uh, regulations. So those we can think of as uh, branches that are uh, coming off the, the, the Occupational Health and Safety Act. It's a slightly lower level of uh, uh, regulation. Then branching off those acts, uh, those regulations, sorry, for example, yeah, noise induced hearing uh, loss regulations. In this picture I'm showing that is like a branch point. Those are the, the codes. There are uh, a large number of codes which are incorporated into into the regulations. Uh, if I remember correctly, the, the noise and use hearing loss might just have one code that relates to the measurement of occupational, uh, occupational noise uh, for hearing conservation purposes. So those structurally then are the, are the there's just the inverted commas, the three levels of, uh, of, of, of occupational and safety law in the province of of, of the OSHA, we've got the, the act itself, we've got the regulations, and we've got the codes. Bearing in mind that once a code is incorporated into a regulation, it has the same standing as, as a regulation. So 
uh, we want us to look at all these regulations and identify the codes that are there, and those are part of our law. Uh, uh, most of the codes, and I'll elaborate on these later, most of the codes are SANS codes, South African National Standards, the old SABS, but some codes are international codes. Um, then to round off the province of, of, of the Occupation Health and Safety Act, interesting for us to, 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 to remember that the Act establishes, uh, re-establishes three institutions. Uh, the Advisory Council for Occupation, Health and Safety, uh, the inspector from the Department of, uh, that time the Department of Labor, Department of Envi uh, Employment and Labor now, and also the third um, institution is the Institution of the Health and Safety Reps and the Health and Safety Committee. So um, it makes us, it presses on our minds that, for, uh, that in particular the Health and Safety Reps and the Health and Safety Committee are in as in, is an important institution of the OSH Act. It's not just a, um, you know, workplace structure, ad hoc kind of thing. Uh, and that's why you'll see, uh, even in maybe in the, say, admin regulations, it is given about how uh, health and safety reps must be elected and, and, and constituted and agreements with, uh, uh, with labor and so forth. So, one needs to accord the health and safety reps and the health and safety committee its due uh, respect in terms of it being an institution. And that's why you'll see a uh, nitpicker like me will always talk to say that there's, it's not an HSC e rep, it's a health and safety rep because um, it's an institution of the OSH Act that needs to be uh, respected in that, on that level. Compensation, as we know, and we'll look at it uh, lightly again later, is via the, 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 the COIDA. Interestingly, again, uh, in the current context, uh, occupational diseases must be uh, reported to, to, to the chief inspector. And also, uh, any medical practitioner, doesn't have to be occupational medicine, occupational practitioner, any medical G a GP, if they uh, uh, suspect that a person's illness, for example, had, is occupational in, in, in nature, they are uh, obliged in terms of OSHAC to, to, to advise the person accordingly and also uh, report that to the, 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 the employer and the chief inspector. And this requirement is it's an obligation on all medical practitioners in the country due, uh, that afford that uh, uh, you know, um, in the area of OSH Act, it's an obligation for all of them to, to report. If I'm not mistaken, it's actually a criminal offense if they don't report. Uh, it, you guys can correct me uh, if I'm mistaken in that one. So that is the general overview of the OSH, the province of the OSH Act, province of the Mine Health and Safety Act. Not an act that I deal with. I've never worked, uh, I can't say never, once in a, in a quarry. Uh, generally speaking, I don't have any experience in OSH with the Mine Health and Safety Act, but it's also interesting to, to note that there's a separate uh, act for um, the mining sector defined by the, 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 the Mine Health and Safety Act. Again, uh, on, a lower, on a lower level, there are um, reg uh, regulations that are, are promulgated in terms of the act. And then also you have sets of guidelines for the compilation of mandatory codes of practice. So this is where sometimes our, these multiple uh, uh, occupational health and safety frameworks can cause some confusion. For someone that's used to the OSHA, if you talk about uh, codes of practice or so forth, one thinks about the SANS codes. But in the mining industry and the mine health safety act, the, the department can can provide can push out um, codes of practice for the for the compilation of uh, I mean guidelines for the compilation of, of, of codes of practice, and there's very interesting ones. Uh, for example, there's a code of practice on the minimum standards of fitness in in the mining industry, um, and uh, 
which defines the 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 the, the like it says the standards that an employee must meet at the medical fitness uh, examination. It's very interesting. Uh, the, the, another one, for example, is the is, is management of uh, uh, of incapacity due to ill health or injury. And another very interesting uh, guideline is 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 the medical incapacity management committees. Um, the folks that are in the mining sector can 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 maybe enlighten us about how those uh, medical uh, incapacity management committees uh, function. It's very interesting. Uh, and so the 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 the, the further then the, the Mine Health and Safety Act also by uh, its its regulations incorporates a large number of sounds codes um, with technical details for various aspects of the work. Compensation wise, there are two compensation acts that that apply in the Mine Health and Safety Act. There's a, a DMA, which is the specific one for, for, for occupational diseases in mines. And it deals with specific uh, medical conditions, mainly uh, lung disease. And then of course the other one is the COIDA. Right? The, the institutions created by the Mine Health Safety Act, again is the Health and Safety Reps and Air Committees, the Mine Health Safety Council, and the inspectorate from the, from the department uh, there. The next one, which is one that's often overlooked, is the, 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 the province of the Maritime Shipping Act. So people who work on ships, like this is called the sailors, right? They are not covered under the, 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 the OSHA. They are covered under the Maritime Shipping Act. Maritime Shipping Act has its own set of regulations, the, the Maritime Occupational Safety Regulations. And there are codes of practice that are also incorporated into this framework. Um, one code of practice which comes from, from, from uh, Portnet deals with, the, 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 for example, the cargo handling personnel like the stevedores and so forth. And there are other codes of practice that come from the UK system which deals with the, 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 the persons working on uh, normal shipping. Uh, operations. So many times, just to recap, you'll, you'll, you'll find that uh, discussions leave out the Maritime Shipping Act as an Occupational Health and Safety Act. It's a, it's a very old act uh, from 1951. It's got a very strange structure. It's not similar. Maritime Shipping Act is not similar in structure to, to the OSHA or the Mine Health and Safety Act, which is something that, we, that one should discuss. Finally, then this weird province of the National Nuclear Regulator, I include it here because it has its own act uh, that covers mainly the, the, the uh, nuclear industry. Uh, and it also has uh, regulations, uh, uh, two sets of regulations that deal with occupational health and safety, like the safety standards and regulatory practices. And then uh, for, with those regulations and so forth, it produces the uh, guideline documents and required documents for, let us say, um, how a place like Kuburg must, must manage occupational um, health issues for their employees. But the, 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 the guidelines and the requirements under the nuclear, National Nuclear Regulator Act also apply uh, for workers who are mining and processing um, radioactive materials, like uh, uranium ore, for example, or even some, uh, if I'm not mistaken, some gold con uh, containing ores have a, a, a radio level of radioactivity. So under the National Nuclear Regulator, there'll be certain requirements for, 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 for those operations to monitor the hazard related to, to that exposure to, nuclear, to radioactive material. So that's why I've got the slide just to again highlight border issues. So the, the National Nuclear Regulator, the, the work, those workers that work in that field uh, um, do fall under OSHA, but there's specific regulations and guidelines and requirements that are, that, that are created by the National Nuclear Regulator. Uh, 
And those requirements can also extend to, to people, for example, who are working in the mining industry and um, will need, in terms of the exposure, as I said earlier, to radioactive material. Um, uh, Maritime Shipping Act, there's, there's issues there that one needs to be aware of because cargo handling operators, stevedores and so forth, will fall under OSHA, uh, whereas the, the ship's hands itself, uh, all those maritime people fall under the um, Maritime Shipping Act. This can cause a, a little bit of complication. Then if we, if we look at it, there's this whole layout from, with a, from a different perspective in terms of the branches of the law, and this comes from some Jutta, I think, uh, publication. Uh, so we can look at national law separate to the international law. And within national law, uh, for our point, we'll have uh, a public law uh, uh, branch, which includes uh, administrative law and constitutional law, interesting, and then private law, which has that branch of, sub-branch of commercial law, and there we see uh, labor law sitting there. So if we overlay uh, OSH, uh, relevant law into these branches, uh, I will I'll propose this kind of uh, overlay can be used. Uh, in the private law side, under employment law, labor law, Labor Relations Act, Employment Equity Act, and then the Genuine Occupational and Safety Act, ones that we've dis uh, discussed earlier. And the admin law, regulatory law, We'll see there's, there's, a, there's a, a list of laws there, like Civil Aviation Act and Maritime Safety Authority, Nuclear Regulator Act, and so forth, are also uh, laws that, as an occupational health and safety practitioner, one needs to be aware of. Uh, we'll come back to that. National Health Act will sit there. Again, in this COVID time, we are talking a lot now about uh, medical examinations and testing and, and, and management of medical cases and so forth, illnesses. We need to take, a, take, take cognizance of some uh, uh, requirements under the National Health Act. Um, Hazardous Substances Act, which also falls within the, the, the Department of Health, also will talk to certain materials, certain equipment, that we don't find, for example, under the, uh, the regulations of the Occupational Health and Safety Act. We come and see, look at examples, or the, one or two of those. So just to give a, 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 some kind of uh, overview again, medical fitness testing regimes that we have in the country, there are many of them. Uh, so mine's health, it's, uh, under the Mine Health and Safety Act, we saw earlier there was mention of a promulgated standards for medical fitness there. So we know the one in construction. And then under uh, other regulations, you'll find there's requirements for medical fitness testing, like your noise-induced hearing loss regulations or asbestos. And uh, in aviation, you'll find also requirements for, for medical fitness testing there. And then likewise in maritime and the nuclear industry, they have their own particular requirements their own regulatory framework in terms of medical fitness uh, testing of the workers in those, in those areas. Uh, another repeat of uh, what I call the con compensation railroad. Uh, I'm being harsh maybe with the concept of railroad. But some people would say that's a little old fashioned and a little slow. So the, 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 the COIDO Act will run through all the, the, the various regions of the country, so to speak. Um, Odumma only will work within mining, but uh, mine workers will, will be covered by both Odumma and uh, Koida. And then also underneath Koida, for example, you'll find circulars that will give specific instructions on specific issues. For example, circular instruction 171 deals with uh, claiming uh, for noise-induced hearing loss uh, compensation. And again, it will also refer to a particular sense code uh, because you've got to supply evidence around exposures and, and assessments for, for hearing loss and so forth. So uh, again, this is a very high level overview. Gaps and, 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 and deficiencies. 
as you can as you can imagine the 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 the, the having this parallel system with three different uh, acts and so forth can cause things to slip through and in one of the previous discussions we spoke for example of the uh, the professions act there's no professions act and that's one of the things that are slipping through in this, in this parallel framework a lot of researchers and practitioners in the fields will, will argue that we need to consolidate this uh, these le this legislation so that we have one overarching osh uh, act and one infrastructure and uh, so that we manage things consistently uh, one needs to take note of all those discussions um, there's, there's other issues for example um, uh, some of the regulations uh, for example, noise-induced hearing loss. Uh, hearing loss, occupational hearing loss, is not only caused by, by excessive noise. It's just one of the hazards that can have that kind of, that uh, negative outcome. But chemicals, exposure to certain chemicals, uh, also can cause hearing loss. Uh, or to toxic chemicals, for example, solvents. So you, so you might be a painter who would, who would, who would never been exposed really to excessive noise. But because you've been exposed to solvents, could have could experience hearing loss. Also, uh, pressure um, noises, pressure though. But pressure, for example, people who work in mines descend and uh, to deep level mining, uh, they experience pressure, uh, excessive pressure on the hearing, the, the on the ears, uh, cause what they call barotrauma. trauma. Uh, people who uh, air crew. Uh, work on the airlines also experience better true. I think a lot of us who have flown maybe between Joburg and Durban have experienced that pressure, that the pain in the ear caused by the pressure the difference, and um, that's better trauma, cause damage to the ear. So uh, radiation can cause damage to the to the ear, um, and so these. Uh, Hazards are not specifically dealt with via the noise and use hearing loss uh, regulations. And claiming compensation for that can be possibly a bit complicated uh, because the regulation is so focused on noise and use hearing loss. And then, beside the hearing loss, you can also have damage to your balance uh, mechanism in the ear. So, the ear does two things it hears and also gives us our, our ability to balance. So again, exposure to say solvents can cause damage to the to the to the balance organ in the ear. So you could be having permanent dizziness and can be incapacitating. And so there's a, is again an issue of how, does the regulations of the law uh, look at that, incorporate that? Uh, because we get, for example, we get a lot of awareness of the issues behind what the law says. You know, the law deals with it. So. Those are some of the issues. Um, for example, in uh, hazardous biological agents regulations, we'll see the uh, classification or, or, or the regulations will deal with uh, bacteria and viruses and parasites, but, don't, but it doesn't deal with, with fungi. So those are some of the problems that we, we need to look at as well. And uh, there, are, there, are, there are others I'm sure that other people know of and, and have tried to deal with. So that's some of the issues that, that lay on firmly on our lap as occupational health practitioners to, to, to look at how we can develop the law um, further. And as, as Dr. Skepers was talking about, it'll be interesting to hear mention this a uh, couple of weeks ago um, about how Occupational health and safety relates to the Constitution and to, uh, and to Chapter 2 of the Bill of Rights. Um, again, a very neglected, I agree with the very neglected uh, thing is that we, uh, you very rarely will hear occupational health and safety practitioners uh, refer to the Constitution and refer to specific uh, rights in, in the Bill of Rights. I, 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 I would often talk about these. Three, for example, Section Ten, uh, the right to human dignity, and 
when you think about the the right to human dignity, it's a, it's the right to the to our our intrinsic worth as human beings, and we know the history of South Africa. And there was an interesting uh, statement made in a judgment uh, by Judge O'Regan, where she stated that the Constitution asserts the our, the, the dignity of all South Africans because the human dignity of, uh, of black South Africans was routinely and cruelly denied in the past. So, so as we practice our, 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 our field of occupational safety, how do we interpret the requirements of the, of the regulations and of the law and the guidelines and the codes in terms of human dignity? Uh, obvious ones is like the pollution facilities. Um, you know, especially now with COVID. COVID is going to require, our response to COVID will require that we, we really improve our practice, the standard of uh, practice in terms of uh, ablutions. The number of ablutions, the facilities, the type, the, the, the maintenance of them, all are very specific um, requirements that we should, we should get clarity on, you know, direction. Uh, how do we handle non-waterborne uh, sewage, for example? Um, lots of times on sites you'll find that uh, portaloos are provided, but there's no hand wash facilities, so they, they don't work, and so forth. Uh, so ablutions is the obvious one. Um, uh, one example I, I experience I had was work, it was working in a in a in a in a, in a medical facility in Pine Town that was bought over by a Swiss company and they sent a team of auditors down to, to do their due diligence. And the occupational health and safety practitioner and the team was very offended by the condition of the ablutions in this, in this big company. He was so offended that he insisted that the, the manager of that facility use the workers' facilities until um, the renovation was complete. Because uh, he just couldn't understand how uh, the pollutions were allowed to, to, to be in that kind of condition. But besides uh, pollution issues, um, the OSH Act and, and other acts require consultation with the health and safety reps and the, uh, the health and safety committee. And it also relates to the dignity that respecting the, uh, these folk as human beings, they have a right to decide and to be involved in the decision making process around how occupational health and safety uh, is implemented in the workplace. Um, section uh, 11, the right to life. It's, and it's not simply just the right to be alive, it's the right to uh, your quality of life. Uh, losing uh, capacities uh, affect your quality of life. And surely that can, should be interpreted as, as, as an, uh, as not respecting uh, the right that you have in terms of the constitution. Uh, disability will cause major changes in your quality of life. Uh, I mean, one that was stunning to me was uh, vibration white finger, where you hear of workers not being able to, 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 to zip up their pants. I mean, it's, 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 it's unbelievable. And in 1627, uh, you know, the right to, to access health care services, occupational health, uh, health services are part of health services. Public, that's why you'll find them under public health. And we, we need to understand that, that we need to see, have a wider view of what occupational health services is about. It's about prevention of disease. It's about uh, curative uh, activities, and it's about rehabilitative activities. So it's a wider scope of activities that we need to to incorporate into our uh, into our understanding of occupational health and safety, and involves psychological issues, psychosocial issues. I mean, we can see what's happening to workers in COVID. The stress people are being placed under um, when the issues at the workplace relating to 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 COVID. So this is uh, essentially my um, lay of the land that I, I like to discuss. And um, 
other things that, uh, that one needs to just, I could repeat is, um, because it's coming up again in a big way, is the issue of uh, medical fitness. COVID is acquiring the, uh, screenings and examinations. And we need to be mindful that different sectors have different uh, um, promulgated standards. Some don't, like construction. There are no promulgated fitness standards in the construction industry. It's a huge issue. Um, if we look, for example, in uh, National Health Act, there are certain issues, uh, the important issues that we need to uh, take note of. For example, the, the rights in, uh, of, of the users of a healthcare service. Uh, if you've got a, a clinic now uh, at the workplace or you've got a testing facility at the workplace, if it had over that 500 worker level, you know, you, one needs to be aware of what the National Health Act will, uh, uh, says about how those facilities are managed, how uh, the standard of services, uh, there's an Office of Standards Compliance under the National Health Act, you know. We need to be aware of those things so that uh, the clinics that we, uh, that we are that we part of, uh, that was the establishment we are part of, satisfies the, uh, the various laws that are applicable. Uh, healthcare professions have, have their own act, and underneath that act, there's the, the ethical requirements, uh, the code of ethics that, 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 that relate to healthcare practitioners. One must look at those guidelines, there are 16 booklets there. Look, at, look for the relevant ones and, and, and consider what it means in terms of how we do screening and how we do testing, how we, do, how we manage cases of COVID. Um, the, the Hazardous Substances Act is interesting because it will include issues related to, um, say for example, uh, X-ray equipment, uh, the use of X-ray equipment. And there's also a policy uh, from the Department of Health related to requesting medical X-rays. Uh, a lot of time that we, we in workplace, we, we People will go for x-rays as part of a medical fitness requirement. Uh, I had a, a, a situation where a particular team was required to, to undergo, I think it was about five x-rays in a period of about six months. And it struck me as a, a bit ridiculous. So yeah, I had to do some investigation to see exactly how is this being done. And if you look at the policy of, of, the, of the Department of Health about who can request a medical x-ray and who can give permission for a person to be x-rayed, make for some interesting reading. Uh, because we are so, uh, willy-nilly you know, around this requirements, and yet we expose people to hazards. Having a, an x-ray is not a hazard-free uh, you know, thing. Then also for, 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 for people involved in, especially um, civil engineering, we've got the code of practice uh, for the safe use of, uh, of uh, density gauges, like the Troxler machines. So you need to be aware of that. That falls under the, these uh, Hazardous Substances Act under the Department of Health. So... Those are just some of the wider things uh, in terms of uh, employment uh, labor uh, regulations and employment equity. Again, we can relate it to medical testing in the workplace. You, uh, I'm sure, guys, you know that you, you need to look in there and see exactly if our medical testing regimes of, could be falling foul of, of the requirements in terms of those acts. So, my, the main point. Uh, uh, I want to drive us that we must not see the, the acts that we are must deal with as simply occupational health and safety acts. There's a wider range of acts. There's a whole web of law that that um, that we are connected to. So, in terms of occupational health and safety act, workers are defined in a in a certain way. In terms of labour law, same workers will be divided, defined in a slightly different way. Under the Health Care Act, uh, National Health Act, the same workers 
can be def defined again differently. And the same goes in terms of the regulatory acts. The same workers that we're dealing with there might have a different definition and the law might see them in slightly different ways. And we've got to be aware that it's quite uh, com complex and our thinking of things must be sufficiently complex so that we, 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 we see this thing in a forward, back, upwards and downwards, left and right uh, perspective. Okay, I think I'll stop there before I bore everybody. Thank you, Fabian. Okay, thank you very much, Warren. That was excellent, once again. Um, do we have any questions uh, for Warren or any, any polls or comments? Please feel free. No questions, no polls. Okay. Radio. Hi, Marvin. Go ahead. Uh, uh, I came in a bit late. My and that's where the duty of care comes into play um, from the lawyers that uh, have been and have been uh, engaging with uh, many others uh, in that uh, instance. What happens is that. The duty of care comes across all references in terms of the law. Um, no noting that you not need to take into account every single bit of law. So if the one does not uh, emphasize uh, um, certain things uh, that might be relevant in another law, and that's where the duty of care comes into play. That's uh, just a comment. Thank, thanks for that, uh, Marvin. Uh, anybody else would like to share anything on the topic, please? Feel free. Okay, no other co comments or polls. Okay, thank you very uh, much. Uh, hi, sorry, Fabian. Oh, sorry, Julia. Okay, no problem. Yeah. Hi, guys. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, Warren. Excellent. Uh, I, I love the graphics, uh, especially on two areas, the borders of, of the land uh, and a key one day in terms of uh, the, the gaps and, and deficiencies. So if, if we can just look at uh, what's next and how does this relate to the OHS profession in South Africa, uh, if you can just give us say an overview because we 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 seem to be uh, talking for the last i would say few years on uh, you know the the getting together setting up a professional act so what would be the next steps if you want to be successful on this that's um, for water yeah uh I think maybe um, um, Fabian can help us create a, a small um, task team on, on on the professions act. Uh, a couple of a couple of us, and of course, people can volunteer. There's no exclusivity. I think one of the things we're fighting is exclusivity. Mm. Uh, let's put together a task team for the for the for the drafting of the uh, professions act. There's, there's a lot of, uh, so we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of examples of professions acts that, uh, in South countries. Africa that we can, mm -hmm. that, and in, yeah. No, you guys with the international experience, obviously going to bring it to the table, right? Oh, no, cool. um, so let's, let's get that, uh, that task team together. Let's just uh, look at the aspects of the international and the local experience. and 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 uh, most of it will just it will be a, a cut and paste because this is the way the you know I mean the, you don't have to be over complicated about it. But there's interesting things, for example, in the legal professions uh, their act, which deals with uh, like for example a provident fund. You know, we 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 uh, if you look at the professions acts in the the accounts for the built environment for the engineers and so forth. Uh, there's, there's, they're all basically the same kind of thing, the same act, slight, slight tweaks. 
uh, related to particular issues, but none of them have a, have a provident fund. And maybe that's because all of those guys are doing pretty well, you know? Mm. Uh, they all have their personal uh, pensions sorted out. Uh, but mm. I, think, um, I think we just need a task team. We give ourselves a, a deadline. And, and, you know, like we, I've said, you know, informally, there's no time to model. Uh, we've got serious things to de deal with. We give ourselves uh, six months to, 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 to draft up, um, uh, uh, you know, I mean, an uh, uh, act. To, and to have a workshop or two or three amongst mm -hmm. ourselves, just the way we're doing it now, yeah. uh, for everybody to, to read and, and, and comment on it. And everybody must read and comment. Mm -hmm. I think um, we, we, we must, we must, we must push each other. Yeah. You know, even if you say, even if it's on one uh, 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 section of, of, the, of, the, of the, the proposed act, mm -hmm. make a comment. Say you read it. Say you didn't understand it. Say you didn't like something, or you or you want something emphasized. But we must get past the silence uh, of of, of so-called junior members or whatever. This is our 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 profession. This is our life. This is our passion. This is our commitment. And you and you must put put that. You must voice uh, your 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 uh, your opinion. We give ourselves six months. We come up with the with the with the act, and then we take it to 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 to, to Parliament. We take mm -hmm. it. We can take it to the Minister of Employment, yeah, because um, we'd want their buy-in and their and their and their blessings. And and we're not threatening anybody, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I hope people who, who belong to the department or, or associates with people in the department are clear that none of this is about threatening anybody. Mm -hmm. We 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 want to push this profession forward, and um, and I think in six months' time we can have something that we all have, uh, you know, signed off on, and we and we and then we take it to the powers that be and say we want this tabled, we want it tabled in the in the parliamentary committee, we want uh, uh, this piece of legislation uh, passed, and then um, parallel to that we will have to look at the issues of uh, of education and training and, and all of those kind of aspects. So that's what yeah. I would uh, suggest. It sounds good. Um, I think what we'll have to do is we'll have to set up a session between us just to put some ideas down table, some, some, some plans, uh, let's say at terms of reference if we can. And then um, once we agree the time of reference, we can then get the, the team together. We can start getting some people together. I'm sure there's quite a few guys that will be, that won't be part of this process. And then I'll also throw it past the uh, Tibo and them to hear from them if that, that that's a plan that we're working on, and yeah, hear from them how's their feel. Um, but I think it's an excellent idea, Warren. So we'll start that process as well. I know there's quite a few things we're planning on working on, but I think if we have the right heads uh, or the right people spearheading each team, we can we can work at these at these items chunk by chunk, fighting through this big elephant. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. All right, cool. Um, any other comments before we, we close? Okay, no other comments. All right, uh, once again, thank you, Warren Manning, for your uh, excellent presentation. Thank you for the time that you've uh, spent on this. We really appreciate it. Uh, to, thanks to everybody that's attended as well. Um, thank you. Uh, stay connected with Connection Point. You always connected. Thank you very much. Yeah.